Infertility problems are complex and involve many factors, some obvious, some not. It is well known that inflammation is at the root of many common health problems. It is not well known inflammation could be connected to infertility. Dr. John Kovaris is a reproductive endocrinologist who is the medical and laboratory director of IVF Phoenix in Arizona. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. John Kovaris to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you, Fanny, for having me. Nice to meet you. So endocrinology, the field, studies what? Well, it studies the um, movement and production and destruction of hormones through your body. I think it's important if you want to understand it, is that hormones are made by a gland, put into the bloodstream, find another organ, bind to it, and, and elicit a response. Mm -hmm. So most of us know how, to, how much is made and we know how much is degraded, but the problem is, is that the conduit, the blood vessels in between, we don't pay any attention. We assume that as long as a person's alive, everything's working. Not so, necessarily not so. Not necessarily so. Mm -hmm. uh, why that field for you? Well, I wanted to do high-risk obstetrics, mm -hmm. but after delivering 5,000 babies in my residency, <laughs> I had post-traumatic stress. <laughs> I'm joking. Mm -hmm. And I decided I would transfer or trade my night times for my weekends. Mm -hmm. It was, I just figured exactly. I would Exactly. Because as you know so well, those babies come any hour of any day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Infertility. Is there a, a working medical definition? Correct. Uh, any couple that's been trying to conceive for over 12 months and haven't achieved that um, pregnancy, then we call them infertile. Mm. Uh, male, female, doesn't uh, matter. 60, 40 split most of the time. It's, it's uncanny how many times couples will find each other who have similar problems so that it's a blended issue most of mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. or often, not most of the time. Uh, what is the test for infertility? Is there one test? Are there five? Oh, there is a basic workup, which I have to say hasn't changed since I was a medical student. We start out looking at the sperm. There are certain parameters, and we determine if they have normal sperm for normal intercourse, for normal um, reproduction. Mm -hmm. We would make sure their fallopian tubes are open. We look to, look to see if the woman has a healthy eggs or signs of healthy eggs and then we look to see if they have um, a uterus that will do normal implantation and those are pretty primitive tests and once they're done we look at them and say if there's nothing there then they, we tend to call them unexplained infertility mm. now sometimes we can look with laparoscopy which is a mm -hmm. non um, uh, minimally invasive surgery and we can look inside and we might see endometriosis or pelvic adhesions but once that's been excluded, pretty much everybody gets told at that stage, I don't know why you're not getting pregnant, you're unexplained. Mm -hmm. And that leaves us with the dilemma. What are we going to do to fix these people or help them? Yes. And <coughs> so where do you begin? Well, I started just like everybody else back in 92. And I started going through the process. And I realized that we weren't very efficient. Um, Dr. Collins in Canada has written something in about 2004 talking about how inefficient the process is. Mm. And he said even with extensive in vitro fertilization, we were only getting about 50% of the patients through. So we were always taught that patients who have infertility, or actually people in general, have about a 20% chance of a month of getting pregnant. And infertile patients probably have less than 1%. So if we were to leave you to your own devices, you have half a percent to one and a half percent each month on their own. We've actually been working now after the 20 years, came up with a model that talked about inflammation. And what we've discovered is that if we clear the inflammation, the process in the blood vessels between where the hormones are made and where the hormones arrive, we can get about 60% of the patients pregnant and none mm -hmm. of them needed in vitro fertilization. That's really interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. Mm -hmm. But as you know so well, because you are an endocrinologist and, and, and most advanced doctors know that inflammatory disease is abundant in our society. What's, what causes it in general? Not necessarily <coughs> with infertile patients, but what causes inflammation of the body? Okay. I don't know if we have enough, <laughs> we have time, enough time to go through this, but let okay. me see if I can synopsize it. Most people hear inflammation and they think infection. Mm because they hear my grandfather has in the hospital, they were inflamed. They had a lot of problems, they added steroids, something was wrong. But if you really want to understand inflammation, think of it as a complex biological changes in our systems. 
that are responding to stresses. And these stresses are um, um, irritants, toxins, um, pathogens like viruses and bacteria. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to heal or we're trying to find a new balance. Sometimes if you gain too much weight, you can't fix that, but you loosen your belt. So you found a new balance and you have a slightly bigger set of clothes or a new balance. Now, in the process of making these balances, there are things that will occur. There's an acute phase, which is supposed to rise and fall. And that's normal, that's the phase of healing. But the problem is, is that sometimes it's not always full healing, and what we do is we make the adjustment, just like my belt gets bigger, and next year my belt gets a little bit bigger. And then one day we look at ourselves and go, how did I get to be so large? Yes. Do you understand? Yes, I do. It creeps up on us. <laughs> inflammation does the same thing. We keep adjusting, we keep adjusting, mm -hmm. and that becomes chronic inflammation. Okay. And what's happening is that you have healing and injury happening simultaneously, and it never seems to find an end. And so these people undulate along with chronic inflammation. Now, you say, where does that go? And I go, well, if you started at 20 and you become 70 and you gain five pounds a year, you might find yourself easily 100 and some odd pounds mm -hmm. overweight. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, how did I get there? Now, is the weight that we gain a sign or a source of the inflammation? Yes. But is it possible that inflammation was a source of our weight gain? Is it possible that as we're inflamed, things in our bloodstream go, what do you want me to do with this irritant? And you go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's stick it into a fat cell until we know what to do. Right. <laughs> and so you put it there. Why not? <laughs> Why not? So you stick it and you harbor it away as a protection. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've noticed is that as patients who are not trying to get pregnant, but who are friends of mine who are older, <clears throat> they will come around and finally retire and say, you know what, now's my day to start gaining back into shape. And they start dieting and they start exercising and the next thing I find is they get a heart attack. And I'm thinking, hmm, in the process of dieting and in the process of exercising, they were releasing this fat. And with the fat came the toxins that they didn't deal with for the last 20 years. And the toxins made the inflammation get worse. And all of a sudden their heart, which already had heart disease and blockage, got more clottable, and next thing you know, they end up with the heart attack. So you need to consider that inflammation, as it comes on slowly, we need to deal with it so that we can take it off slowly. Mm -hmm. And things should be in a regulated manner. Now there are what they call inflammatory diseases, arthritis, right. asthma. Irritable bowel, irritable inflammatory bowel. bowel disease, Alzheimer's. But there are other diseases now. There, in my field, <clears throat> we talk about um, disorders or adverse pregnancy outcomes, stillbirths, preeclampsia or toxemia. We have patients who have um, uh, preterm labor, preterm delivery, early and late miscarriages. And we are now, just in the last two, three years, they've stated, we suspect strongly that these are related to inflammation. They didn't seem to bring infertility into the picture, except that, listen to this, Infertile patients who do manage to get pregnant have a three to five times risk of an adverse pregnancy outcome. So I would, I would postulate that there is a nice connection, association. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying cause and effect, right. but I think infertility is part of the process. How controversial is it? Oh, it's, it's seminal right now at this point. Mm. People would look at this and say, never heard of it, no big papers, We're, it's, not, it's too complex to study. I'm not going to adhere to it. I'm going to stick with what I know. You're a board certified endocrinologist, so <laughs> you have the cred, I have as the they cred. say. And, and you really believe at a deep level that uh, inflammation has a lot to do with infertility, in many cases, in Absolutely. some cases. In, my in all cases? No. 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 I, ha I will tell you that we're noticing that unexplained infertility, which used to be almost not diagnosed, is happening to be about 20, 21% of our explanations now to patients after we go through the four that we described. 21% mm -hmm. now fall into this, well, we don't know, let's go forward. When a couple comes to you, and I assume you deal with uh, the couple, not just with the man or the woman, and comes to you at the uh, at clinic in Phoenix, uh, what tests do you put them through? Uh, what are the politics around the donor <coughs> eggs and all of the above? Let me give you a little idea. My first visit's an hour, hour and a half. The question's probably just nonstop. And we've discovered things. For example, 
it's uncanny how many women have what's called primary severe dysmenorrhea. When you were a young girl, starting out with your first period within the first six months, I ask, what were your periods like? And this women will go, they were okay, they, were bad, well, they weren't bad. And then there will be that group that says, they were horrible. Mm. And I go, like, mom, I have to miss school horrible? And they go, absolutely. Every day, one or two days, I would be curled up with a heating pad and mm -hmm. miss school. That relationship has evolved now where I start to realize there's a pattern. Women will say, I have had a history of asthma. I have a history of irritable bowel. I have migraines. My fingers and toes are cold. Um, as they progress, then you, they'll even uh, remark, I don't tolerate alcohol like I used to. And I have altitude issues. I used to be able to go to the mountains and do well. Now I get tight head, and I'm very short of breath, and I don't feel strong. And so you start listening to this, and you think, it's uncanny how they could all seem to keep having this pattern. Mm -hmm. And after you look at it, you go, what's the commonality? Well, the blood is often the commonality amongst all of these different organs. But really, when you look at it, it's called smooth muscle. That is the type of muscle that is all through our body, especially in our blood vessels. And it's our uterus. It's the, what's the biggest collection of smooth muscles, your mm -hmm. uterus. Now, if you make smooth muscle overwork, what happens? The cramping isn't normal. It's titanic. It's like a foot cramp. Mm -hmm. If you make smooth muscle in your bronchi overwork, it's asthma. If you make smooth muscle through your sm smooth um, mm -hmm. small bowel overwork, it's irritable bowel, bloatedness, constipation. I try to explain to patients, imagine you had a heart and it doesn't get enough blood flow, or mm -hmm. if it did, you could have a heart give you enough flow to keep alive, keep you alive, and if you wanted to run upstairs, you could do it. But if you didn't get the flow, the heart would say, give me two out of the three. And you'd say, well, if I sit here, my heart will stay alive, I'll stay alive. But if I try running upstairs, I'm going to get angina, chest pain, I'm going to collapse. If your bowel doesn't get enough flow, it'll say, I'll, I'll keep myself built and, mm -hmm. and, and intact. I'll absorb the food, but I'm not going to peristall, so I'm going to be constipated. Or I'll keep myself alive, but I won't absorb the food, and I'll peristall, so it'll be diarrhea. Now or I won't keep myself alive, I'll break down, I'll become ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And there were some interesting studies that came out on Crohn's disease where they gave people blood thinners to cause dilation, actually to combat the clotting that's noted, and the Crohn's disease went away. Really? But that, that was so out of everyone's mentality, mm -hmm. they, they, they threw it to the side. They said, we, we just can't adhere to this. Inflammation, we were giving patients who have severe um, um, diabetes, rheumatoid medications. And lo and behold, the diabetes went away and everyone went, what, how do you give an anti-inflammatory for rheumatoid arthritis? And the diabetes got better. How is it that I can give people who have failed three rounds or three types of medication for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, a gout medicine, and all of a sudden their inflammatory bowel disease goes away. We have to stop looking at inflammation as a, as a simple little cause and effect, it's like a mobile that mm -hmm. hangs. And every time when something gets moved, myriads of other things start shifting. Sure. And you have to understand the shifting. You know, as humans, we want one test. Absolutely. I want to come to the doctor and say, excuse me, could you tell me whether or not I have inflammation? Right. Is it a blood test? Is it this kind it, of test? Is it that kind of test? It, not necessarily. It's a panel, unfortunately. And you have to extract depending on what you hear. Cholesterol, high cholesterol to me is another sign of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And here we are in, in the States trying to correct all of these problems by hammering people's cholesterol down with bigger and bigger drugs. And it's not seeming to get them to the deal. So there's another way to do it, obviously. Well, if you push too hard with one thing, ultimately you're going to either, either create a toxic effect or it's something's going to snap. And doesn't it make better sense to grab the wheel here and here and two other parts here rather than try to grab at one spot and pull until it just gives. If we had mm -hmm. to pull a boat out of the water, you wouldn't grab on the stern and haul, it would snap the boat. But if you got behind, you pump the water out, you pulled there, <clears throat> you lift it up in the back, all of a sudden you get that boat back up. Yeah, way easier. Uh, Dr. John Coveras, our guest, he is, uh, can I call you the president, the lead doctor, <laughs> the head honcho <laughs> at the medical and, and uh, uh, lab in Phoenix, the IVF lab. We'll come back.